okay for those of you who are here um, we'll just go through this uh, basically kind of a, a debriefing so to speak of, of what we just saw this is the great 2017 total solar eclipse occurs at 247 which is what 20 minutes ago so this is what we had outside this this graphic was produced with the program called stellarium stellarium.org you can download it it's free it's a great program um, it's a great pc planetarium software so to speak you can run it on any platform that's what i produced this with right this is the sun at maximum eclipse today this is what it would have looked in a perfectly clear sky this is what we would have saw the planet venus is off to the right here uh, the sun is the moon sitting in front of the sun okay so this is the path of totality at 10 18 this morning it, it uh, makes landfall on the west coast of oregon uh, mountain time? I mean, pacific daylight time pacific time, pacific time. And makes its way across the country and exits off the coast, the eastern coast of South Carolina, down here uh, at this time, 2:30. Um, that was what 40 minutes ago. So right now it's out here somewhere. It's moving at a speed of 1,800 miles an hour, 2,400 kilometers an hour. Um, it's the moon's shadow. So as fast as the moon is moving in its orbit, that's how fast the shadow is moving across the surface, right? Okay, so what is a total solar eclipse? The moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, but is 400 times closer. Okay, so that geometrical alignment and the, you know, is such that the moon perfectly eclipses the sun along that, allowing us to observe aspects of the sun that normally would be invisible, such as the solar corona, the hot tenuous outer atmosphere of the sun, the solar chromosphere, the hot layer of gas just above the sun's surface, or the photosphere, and prominences, bright just of gas, of hot gas that can extend more than 100,000 kilometers out into space above the photosphere. They consist mostly of hydrogen, a little helium, and they're anchored to the photosphere. Okay, now the solar corona, I should mention, is measured in millions of degrees and is poorly understood why the sun's corona is so much hotter than the photosphere disk, which is about 6,000 degrees. Okay, so it, it, the corona is measured in millions of degrees, whereas the actual disk of the sun, the photosphere, is about 6,000 degrees. Well, you can measure it through um, its color temperature. Who asked the question? Okay, this, this, um, its peak output, its peak light is yellow-green part of the visible spectrum. The sun behaves as a black body. Black body is an object that absorbs all energy, radiates none. Okay, yes. Oh, the hat. Okay, um, so I should say reflects none. Absorbs all reflects none, but it radiates at a certain temperature based on how hot it is. A certain peak temperature, a certain peak color. The peak color for the sun is yellow green. Based on that peak color, we can compute the temperature to be such and such. It's about 6,000 degrees. It's a black body. <laughs> what is a partial solar eclipse? The same geometry exists for this type of eclipse, eclipse, except that the observers is outside the narrow 120 kilometer wide path of totality. For this eclipse today, the center line of that path makes landfall just north of Newport, Oregon, 10:18 this morning, Pacific Daylight Time, and extends across the continental U.S. and exits the continent, 60 kilometers north of Charleston, at 2:50, which is uh, what 20 minutes, uh, 50, 25 minutes ago. Here in New York, we'll observe a 70% eclipse, which means we'll get about half the amount of daylight. Well, we did. You, you saw how much dimmer it got, right? Uh, how much? Uh, it would be half of what we normally would observe. Okay. Okay. So this is the actual, a graphical depiction of the geometry of this of an, of an eclipse. Here's the sun, the Earth, and the moon in its orbit around the Earth passes through the Earth's shadow. This is the moon between the Earth and the sun. And the, the this is the umbra. And this is this other cone here, this gray cone, the lighter gray is called the penumbra. Okay. 
All right. And that's the um, kind of an animated version of what we just saw. Okay, and this is uh, Earth, Sun, and Solar Prominence to scale. Here's the disk of the Sun. This is about 100,000 kilometers. Here's the disk of the Earth. So you're going to get a good sense of the sizes involved. Okay, this is the great July 11th eclipse in Mexico, Cabo San Lucas. I took this. This is an animated composite of a series of frames. This is uh, the diamond ring effect. Here's some prominences here. This is the solar chromosphere, the ruby red. Here's a prominence. Here's a few prominences here. You're starting to see the solar corona here. It's a composite of about 22 frames. Okay, and that's repeats. These are the partial phases. This is what we just saw here today, like this. This. That's the entire eclipse you know, seen in Mexico, a composite of uh, 22 frames. You see the prominence down here. The outer tenuous hot atmosphere of the sun is out here, the solar corona. You were there? I took these. With that same telescope that you saw tonight, or this afternoon, took these same pictures in 91. No, that's mine. I, I made that telescope. Oh, really? Yeah. So that's the, the last part of the, and then it starts getting brighter again after the Yes, exactly. I'll go back one. Yes, those are sunspots, exactly. Okay. See, this is what they saw in South Carolina along the path of totality. Hopefully, fingers crossed, they got some good ones. We don't know. Is there an effect on the tides when you have totality? Um, not really, well, not, I would imagine, very minimal. It would be the normal high tides at full moon, at new moon. See, the gravity is uh, so much weak, weaker from the sun than the moon, so we're not going to really feel the effects. Normally, the gra gravity would add, the effect would add, but the sun is so much further than the moon. We would feel more of a tidal effect from the moon than the sun. Okay, so these guys are... They're in Oregon, right? Yep, these are... All right. They were in an air. They were basically eclipse chasers. They were flying along. They can't keep up with the moon shadow, but they can lengthen the duration of the eclipse by, you know, following it. They were also scientists at various points along the path of totality, collecting data on the solar corona. Okay. Okay. So this is who we are. We're promoting global awareness of how astronomy benefits society and humankind. The Eclipse Viewing and this conference is made possible by Astronomy for Change. Those interested in visiting our website, please go to astronomyforchange.org. Please visit astronomyforchange.org. Astronomy for Change is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to affect positive change through science generally and astronomy specifically with the hope of inspiring current and future generations to become more engaged and interested in astronomy and science. Don't forget to visit Astronomy for Change blog, where you can find all types of information, great articles, content about astronomy, science, and technology. Okay, we, event, we host events and webinars as part of our mission to engender public interest and discourse in astronomy and science. We host online and offline events to engage, inspire, and educate worldwide. As part of our mission to affect positive change, we liaise with our communities through outreach and education. The youth are very important, and today will be the leaders of tomorrow. At Astronomy for Change, the inspiration and education of our youth is at the heart of our mission to affect positive change. If you would like, you can become an Astronomy for Change member. By joining Astronomy for Change, you can receive all the latest information about education, tools, and news related to technology, astronomy, and science. With your free membership, you will receive... A package includes membership or the opportunity to join a club, Night Sky Network, we're part of NASA Night Sky Network, 
free access to astronomy online conferences, webinars, interviews with NASA members, educators, and scientists, as well as PhD astronomy professors. So they're continually learning about... Con uh, yes. Basically, the whole point in this is yeah. to... Is, is, in 2000, this has, it, has its origins in, in 2009 was the International Year of Astronomy. Okay, it was a three-pillar three um, outreach to the world, so to speak. It was a um, part of UNESCO and the United Nations and the International Astronomical Union. It was the 400th anniversary of Galileo's use of the telescope to confirm the Copernican model, which placed the sun at the center. It was the 40th anniversary of the man landing on the moon, and it was the 400th anniversary also of Johannes Kepler and his orbit, orbit uh, his laws of orbital motion. Okay, um, so it was a worldwide event. Many of the projects are still ongoing. So astronomy for change kind of has the same ethos and the same mission to raise, just raise the bar educationally uh, you know, in the form of outreach, education, uh, and science generally, and astronomy specifically. Okay, using that basically as a tool or as a a, uh, a reference for society in general. Trying to have people look up and literally reach for the stars. Kind of, it's one of these, it's, it's a motivational thing. A part of it's a motivational thing. So. And to the kids, do you want to be an astronaut? Do you think astronauts are cool people? When I was growing, when I was your age, I thought astronauts were heroes. They were cool people. They were people who risked their lives. They, a rocket is basically a controlled explosion. You know that, right? When a rocket blasts off, you've seen the space shuttle. Maybe you're too young for the space shuttle. I don't know. But you see a rocket lift off. That's a controlled explosion. So you put people on top of that rocket on top of a controlled explosion. And some of them die. And some of them die. But the, when they sign up for that job, they know that and they say, that's fine. But we're going to take that risk because at the end of the day, it's worth it if everything works out. But they, people generally look at that kind of attitude as someone who's a hero. This, the, the ethos of service to all rather than service to self. Yeah, this this telescope. Oh, the, when I was 13 years old, I built my own backyard observatory. In my parents, but my childhood home in Comac, I built an observatory. Oh, that's a good qu wow, that's a good question. He wants to know if there's any clear consensus on the origin of the moon. Well, I have kind of a hybrid theory of my own. The the general. I should say the most of the consensus is that the um, the moon was knocked out of the Earth by a collision with a, with something that came in from the outer solar system, a planet the size of Mars. Okay, some of it works, some of it doesn't. When we take into the fact that um, the um, the fact that the Earth captured the moon. See, if, if, if it had enough energy to come in and slam into the Earth, the energy would be transmitted, it would be gone. So my hybrid theory is same thing happened, but instead of a direct impact, it was a glancing impact. It knocked off the material, went into orbit around the Earth. No, the moon came in, I beg your pardon, the moon came in at a glancing angle. Some of the forward kinetic energy was transmitted as rotational energy, sped up the Earth, because 24 hours a day is pretty fast. You look at the other planets, they're very slow compared to 24 hours. Okay, so, so some of that forward kinetic energy was transferred as rotational energy to speed the Earth up, reducing the, the moon's kinetic energy, slowing it down, allowing the Earth's gravity to capture it. That's my theory, but that's not the consensus. To me, see, any, any theory in science, all the data has to fit. You can't force the data to fit your theory. The theory has to match the data. 
but that's generally how, that's generally the thinking. Something from the outer solar system came in, collided with the Earth back in the early, the late bombardment phase, which is about 800 million years after the whole thing formed, which is 3.8 billion years ago, and that's four and a half billion years old. So it was. Yeah, well, the Oort cloud, not maybe the uh, the Kuiper belt. Yeah, it would be the Kuiper, not the Oort cloud would be too far. Yeah, sure. Let me take this off. Okay, so so what did you think of today's event? Yeah, educational. Educational. Nice. Was, okay. Good. I'm glad everybody came out for it. I'm glad you guys. Are. Was it, oh, thank you. The the uh, sun. We were treated to uh, three sunspots. Spots. Sunspots basically are slightly darker regions on the sun's surface. Uh, slightly cooler, becoming thus darker. Based on that black body idea I described before. So, okay. Anybody questions? Okay. Very good. So, thank you for coming out. Appreciate it. And um, thank you for your knowledge. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> oh, thank you. Of course. <laughs>